Hello, welcome to Big Box PC Game Collectors uh, Hangout number 17. We're going to hang out today and shoot the crap, so to speak. Uh, Joe, how you doing? I'm doing real good. How you doing? <laughs> doing pretty good. <laughs> Sunday, I got a beer. I'm doing fine. All right. Uh, got my Hyperion t-shirt on. Um, doing great. Excellent. Oh, I wanted to I wanted to bring up a topic right off the bat. I thought it was funny as heck. Uh, you know those ridiculously rare instances where someone you you don't really know very well unexpectedly walks up and starts talking about your hobby. Has that ever happened to you? None of my hobbies, no. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm literally at work and I'm taking a break. And some guy that I barely know comes up and says, hey, you know, I was thinking about you the other day. He said, uh, I found an audio cassette. I said, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. Nice. An audio cassette. He says, no. He says, this is the Ultima 6 audio cassette. Oh, God. Holy mackerel. How the heck did you, one, know that I was a collector, and two, know what that was? <laughs> and he said he purchased it back in 1990. And uh, but he swore he didn't have autographs on the cover of the box. I'm like, you better go home and check because they're definitely on there. So he bought a special edition. Gosh, what? 25 years ago. Wow. And he still has it, but he stumbled across the cassette in an old box and went, "I got to tell Joe about this." So I what's thought that was really cool. gonna do with it. <laughs> no idea. You know? Do you have one? I have. Yeah, I have like three of them. Okay. It's the it's a special edition. I you know me. You know, occasionally when I'm in a thrift store or something, I'll kind of <laughs> thumb through the the cassette tapes just with this weird fantasy that I'm just going to bump into one. Ah. it's never happened yet, but it, the odds are good. It might. <laughs> How many of those are there out there? You know, I really don't know. I really do not know. I would figure at least ten thousand. That would yeah. be my guess. But I really can't say. Hmm. I'm sure there's paperwork somewhere in here that describes how many there were, but I don't know. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I'd love to get my hands on that. Uh, what I did get my hands on, though, uh, was a copy of Savage Empire. Oh, nice. I'm just thrilled to actually have, finally. Uh, the box got a little, little dingy on it there. One ding? That's it? One little ding, that's it. But for the price that I got it for, I'm not going to complain. Um, paid 40 it, bucks for it. 40 bucks? Yeah, 40 bucks. Yep. Bargain and a half. Is it complete? Yeah, yeah it's, it's complete, too. It's got everything in there. Um, you got your maps here. You got uh, whatever this is. I don't even know what this is. Mm -hmm. uh, discs. You got your read me first sheet. You got Reference guide, disk exchange form, this ca the catalog from from that year. <laughs> yep, even the uh, old uh, registration card. Fantastic. So I did I did good on that one. Uh, Speaking of which, there was a special edition for Savage Empire as well. That had right. it was autographed by Richard Garriott, and it came with a T-shirt, which was really cool. I didn't even know about that. Oh yeah. I wonder if that's on the Ultimate Collector site. Um, it's got to be. I had no idea that even existed. Worlds of Ultima series, Savage Empire, IBM PC. Uh, nope, you just list standard edition. You don't list that one. Special edition, five and a quarter inch, right there it is. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Mm. Uh, white white T-shirt featuring dinosaur artwork and the slogan "I conquered the Savage Empire," plus the official Savage Empire hemp book. Neat. You got one of those? On the Origin Flipping Museum, of course I have one of these. Yeah, I wonder. Did you show that during the T-shirt episode? No, I didn't, because I just found it about a half an hour ago. That is a kick-ass shirt, man. It's the Wild Basin Expedition. Mm. And Wild Basin is a nature park in Austin. Yeah. So, yeah, but that came with a t-shirt and it was autographed by Garriott. So, 
Sorry, I didn't mean to trump your, your awesome no, no, that's That's um, useful information because I didn't even know that existed. That wasn't that wasn't forty dollars. No, I'm sure. <laughs> you definitely got the deal of the week with that. Yeah, yeah, I did good. Um, you know, if you're a cheap Ultima collector like I am, it's uh, not impossible uh, unless you're dealing with uh, Ultima One, apparently, <laughs> which never <laughs> never goes for forty bucks. But uh, I'm keeping my ear to the ground. What's the average price of an Ultima One these days? Yeah, uh, three, four hundred bucks. You're joking. No, thereabouts. Um, depending on which computer you buy it for, obviously. The Atari ST one is not as sought after uh, as the IBM PC one is for whatever reason. There's a Commodore 64 one on eBay right now that's 284 bucks, which is actually a decent, decent buy for that one. Holy macaroni! Yeah, I'll be waiting for a auction on that though. I think. Um, I'm so glad. I'm so glad I collected early on. Yeah, I was, um, I was actually talking to Heather about that just the other day. That um, I wish my head had been in the right place a few years ago. You know, I think we were looking at Nintendo games at the flea market, and it just uh, man, if I just thought of it back then, you know, and I don't. It's a curious thing. I don't know why everyone's head got in the right space at the same time. You know, I guess, like, why is it that, like, via game collecting, everyone just kind of thought it was a thing at the same time, unless uh, the seeds were planted by these YouTube folks. I'm not sure. They didn't. It just got incredibly popular at the same time because everybody reached 20 years, everybody reached their 30s mm -hmm. and wanted to get back all of the things that they had when they were 10. Yeah, so yeah, that's kind of what happened with me. I mean, I was uh, kind of around the house thinking about all the, the games I had to throw away when I moved, and uh, it was killing me. <laughs> right, and that was right, and that's that's basically the reason that a collectible is a collectible because yeah. they were inexpensive. Everybody had one, and then we all threw them all away. Mm -hmm. so, you know, I'm at this uh, same flea market. And I went into this store, and this store is just the nastiest freaking store. And I, I mean, I feel dirty. It's the sort of place that you rub your arms down with, uh, you know, that aloe, the germ killing gel. Whenever you walk out of that place, it's so freaking disgusting. <laughs> and uh, uh, I walk in this. The only place I ever find big box games, though, for some reason, and he rarely has them, but sometimes he does. The guy knows nothing about them. Like he had, uh, he had a box for Dark Forces, which I had everything that was supposed to go in the box, but I didn't actually have the box, so it threw it away, and he had this Dark Forces box, and I said, he, he wouldn't sell it to me, and I said, man, I will give you $10 right now, right here, for that empty box, <laughs> you know, and uh, he took the deal, uh, and so I got the box, but anyway, that's in here and there, for this last time we were there, this last, it was yesterday morning, uh, there in the box sitting on the floor is a pile of big box PC games. Most of them were like flight simulators and stuff that I wasn't particularly interested in. But sitting on top was a copy of Outpost 2, which I was interested in. But, you know, these guys, man, they, you know, I don't know. He put like a crate, if he put like a box of uh, anvils on it or something. Or <laughs> he like uses it as padding when he goes to football games for seat. I don't know. But this thing had water damage. It was crushed. Um... It felt grimy on the surface, and I'm like, I can't, I can't give you money for this. This is ridiculous, you know. Yeah, I want to give the guy a hint and be like, look, man, people that buy big PC games are out there, but you can't, you can't just let them sit them in a sink and run water over them for 24 hours and expect people to freaking buy them, you know. There you go. There you go. Unbelievable. But I did. This same guy bought my copy of Ultimate Underworld from. Got it for ten bucks. It was complete. So. You just got to get them before they ruin them, that's all. Fantastic. Man, you get all the bargains. See, I ended up buying when the market was high as well, mm. when eBay was just hitting. And I had my own collection, and that was nice, but I got most of my stuff from eBay initially. But you know, I don't really get the bargains because I had to drive 70 miles to find it. So... And then how many times did I go 70 miles to find that one game? I go, we go to Asheville, which is this closest city, often. So there's no telling how much money I spent on gas 
to get that one game, you know. That kind of price gotten on eBay for 20 bucks. But you also have to consider you're spending that gas not because you're after a particular game, so you have to add it to the price of your collection. You're doing that for fun either way. I mean, yeah. you obviously come home with more than games, I imagine. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like, we, buy, we buy pub glasses like the one I'm drinking out of here. Sure. We buy, we buy all kinds of stuff. Right, that's things. your that is your hobby, and that's what it is. Uh, so I like uh, I enjoy haggling with people, and it's a lost art. But man, I tell you, you get into a good haggling match with someone, it's a lot of fun. I hate it. I can't stand it. Oh, I love it, man, because I feel like I'm taking advantage of people. It's a great feeling. <laughs> I just can't. You know, you. It's amazing when you lowball someone and they take it. You know, it's like you feel real good about yourself for some reason. So how are you doing, Stuart? I'm pretty good. I'm wondering if anybody else is going to show up today. It seems like a very slow day for some reason. Yeah, We're all you get, my friend. <laughs> are we not, we're not good enough for you? <laughs> I'm really happy to spend time with you guys, but, uh, you know, I, I wonder where all the uh, throngs of adoring crowds of fans are. <laughs> <laughs> They're Stu Stuart's fans. Uh, you know, they're not, they don't exist. These right. kids today with their hair and their clothes, they're out gallivanting. <laughs> so I've used um, East Bay for many years since I heard about it um, to, like, snipe auctions on eBay. That's the one I use, and I've been very happy with it. Um, and the nice thing about it is they still have my bid history going back since I started using them. Like, the eBay auctions are long gone. Even my email has changed a couple times, but... They still have the history, so I can see exactly what I... If I wanted to, I could add up everything I bought, <laughs> except for me buying it now. What the auction? And that's probably a very dangerous thing. I mean, I, I'm probably very scared of I saw that number. <laughs> but... I have never done that before. I didn't know you could do that. Yeah, you can go back and, and just basically look. And then also you see, like, what you got when and how much it cost. So I think back earlier it was a lot cheaper... So there it is now. My gosh, I would probably be humiliated. He says as he goes and looks this information up. I've been kind of cold on eBay recently. I haven't done any, yeah, mostly because of DragCon, I guess, but um, I haven't bought anything uh, super recently. Still on the hunt for Ultima 1, still on the hunt for BioForge. Those are my two biggies. And, um, War of the Lance is another one that has a side game, which is the only gold box size game I'm missing besides Never Winter Nights. Which there are no copies of on eBay right this second. So what do you know? Uh, this seems like an opportune time since we're talking about eBay. To uh, I wanted to have a PSA, public service announcement type of thing. Um, was brought to our attention that there was a copy of Akalabeth, one of the most sought-after PC games. I guess Apple II games, if you want to be real specific. But um, it appeared on the eBay recently, and uh, was brought to the group's attention. And it kind of ex it kind of is a good reason to make sure that you're a member of a community like this, because it can be very useful. Um, in these sorts of situations where what you have here is a count, basically a counterfeit game. It's a fake game, and we're talking about a game that's worth literally thousands of dollars. And um, someone bought this game, and um, uh, they you know, got taken advantage of. But uh, definitely join, join a, a community, uh, no matter what you're into collecting. And if you're unsure about something, ask. Because in our particular group, we have some of the most knowledgeable people in the hobby. And they can tell you if it's fake or not with very little uh, research time. Now, did that auction actually end? According to the listing, it says it ended with uh, the, he, the seller accepted an offer. I don't know what the offer was, but I'm assuming it was very high. I'm sure the so, offer was like, go screw yourself. That's another thing. If you throw a... If you got an auction that's out there for four thousand dollars and the guy accepts a five hundred dollar offer on it like immediately, chances are pretty good it's not real. <laughs> but uh, you know, no, no, 
maybe you just wanted to get rid of it. I think in general, they're like people are a lot of people are getting into this hobby, is my impression. And most of them are uneducated about what things should cost and things like that. So it's very easy for a seller to trick them, not only with fake items, but also with you know, a couple of items that are overpriced. Like if the two sellers collude and they both price the item very high, and the unsuspecting buyer will think, oh, this is what it's really worth. Or if there's a buy it now that someone buys, either it's a real buy it now or maybe it's a shill bid or who knows, then automatically it's like that's the new value for this item in some people's minds. And I think a lot of people are getting taken to the cleaners. And at the same time, there are still so many like more obscure titles that, I, that I'm looking for that sometimes I have to pay money for, you know, for other people looking for it too, and a lot of times they just go for very cheap, and I feel like people just don't even know about these games. Not that they're not desirable, but they're just not at people's radar, because everyone's, everyone's getting in right now, they're all going for the top ones they played, you know, like the Doom or whatever else, and when they get to the second tier of items, that that will probably blow up too, so I don't know. Well, the weird thing that I have found about it is that is that there's a history on how objects end up becoming desirable in the PC game market. I did it quite by accident one time and inadvertently made an origin title a ridiculously rare and obscure title because on my website I was posting different things and one of the things that I had was a game that's called Caverns of Callisto. It was literally one of the first titles that Origin ever put out. And uh, it came out the exact same time as Ultima 3. And I had a copy of this and bought it very inexpensively and ended up putting it on my website and going, hey, this is really cool because it's incredibly rare and it's really, it's, it's, it's really neat. And all the collectors started to go and find it. So it ended up raising the price of a Caverns of Callisto to an exorbitant amount. You can't touch it for under 250 bucks now. I think there's a general thing where people want stuff because they know other people are looking for it, which is sort of dumb, really. But, I mean, like, the truth is, like, I have no interest whatsoever in having a Mount Drash for, for most perspectives. But if I sold it to the store, obviously I would buy it because I know it's worth money. Um, and maybe I'd, if I found it for really cheap, I would keep it as part of my collection, but I wouldn't go searching for it. But I think there are a lot of people that go out searching for stuff, and they want stuff, and they put it on their list because they find out that it's very rare, and other collectors want it, and because of that, they want it too. It's like my kids, but like my son, who's seven years old, he wants stuff that his the sister has, who's five, just because she has it. He doesn't care about it at all aside from that. But it's like collectors are little babies too in some respects, and they act the same way. It's it's really a strange phenomenon. So this is definitely, Joel, the way to get more people into the group. You know, thank you, Stuart, for clarifying that most game collectors are a bunch of children. <laughs> it's just human nature, but I, I think it's true what I said. I mean, I don't know if you guys just disagree, but oh, I think I've noticed want it. stuff because other people want it. I've noticed it many, many times, especially those people that put up want lists. And what burns me even more is that a lot of times these people get their way. They put up a want list for five, six years, and eventually half of those titles end up coming to them. And then no matter what anybody says, oh, I have these titles, I saw that they were on your want list, they go, oh, I'll give you 10 bucks a piece for them. And then they get $100 titles for peanuts. It definitely works in our group because if you ever if you pay attention to my buying habits, like my new acquisition posts, it always uh, I'll always have a game that, that I buy that comes after someone else's game because I'll see it on the group and I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that game. I really want that one. I go search on eBay, find a pretty good price, and pick it up. So uh, the group is kind of bad for uh, <laughs> bad for the old wallet when it comes to that. But yeah, that's probably the same phenomenon Stuart's talking about. I see what other people have, and I want it, you know, basically. But that's slightly different, because that may be just something like someone spurred something in you that you forgot about it, or you saw something that's like, oh, that looks cool, so I want it. I think there are other titles that people just want so they can, because there's, there's two sides of the collective. You're talking about the nostalgia and you know, the joy of having the game and whatever else, and I'm all for that, but 
there are some people who collect because they want to be the best. Like the po- I'm the Pokemon master. I already sell Pokemon, and therefore the stuff that's like really desirable. That's what they need to get to prove their manhood, basically, or their womanhood, or whatever it is. If I I can have a million copies of some other game, but it doesn't matter. But if I got that at Cal Beth, then I'm really important. I'm really hot stuff, and now I'm like here with Fortran Dragon and you know all this other nonsense. That's that's what I'm talking about. Great, you're not making any friends today, are you, Stuart? <laughs> Why should I be different than the other day? <laughs> oh, I oh I said all right, but uh no, I understand. But but there's a funny twist to that as well. There is the completest collector, like some members of our group, some of our regulars, that basically say. I need to collect every single title in this genre. And they say, I've only got two left. They're the rare ones, or they're the hard-to-find ones, or they're the expensive ones. But I don't care what it costs. I need to finish this block. And we all have that desire to be able to go, boom. I mean, people still to this day, there are, I believe, that close to 50% of the people in our group think that, collecting sealed titles is the dumbest thing in the world. And I understand where they're coming from, but there's something about, for me, having a sealed collection, and I'm missing like two, that I have to go, I got to get this in a sealed form so that I have a brand new copy, just one of every single title that Origin ever made. And I'm very, very close. I have that same... uh... Uh, phenomenon that you're talking about because I, I'm, I've gotten to the point with the Ultimate Games that I have to have every single one and I'm starting to get to the point where I desire re-releases even. Like I linked uh, in the chat um, that Ultima 3 that, that popped up. That was a US Gold re-release. I've never seen one before. But man, I'd love to have it because that didn't pop up very often at all. I never see those uh, on there. But uh, like the different releases uh, of the Ultima 3s and you know Ultima 2 and all that stuff. I just, I, just, I don't know. There's something weird, some kind of weird psychosis where I want to, I just want all of them. It's strange. I can't explain why. I just do. It's back to Pokemon again. But I know where you were going with that, Stuart. Like that guy that basically just wants to be able to be king of his world. And that never appealed to me that much. But you know that guy that basically pulls out five Black Lotus cards. Look at this! I have, you know, I have more Black Lotus cards than you, and, you know, it's like, well, what about the rest of your collection? Never mind about that now. Look! Look at my Black Lotuses. I listen, I definitely know how it feels. Like, I also like a certain niche of things that I try to collect, and I like to have every one of them. Um, but I don't, I don't, there's two things. One is, I don't want those because someone else wants them. I want them because I want them. That's number one. So if you want them because you want them, that's great. Just don't want them just because someone else wants them. The other thing is, I, I feel like there's no limits to some people, which I find surprising because, like, Nintendo collectors, if you look at them, like, they mostly collect carts, not the boxes and whatnot. And there's tons of carts that are loose and cheap and whatever. And then there's this, the, 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 the 30 holy grails that they all want, and, they, and they're not most of them going to get it because, like, there's only, what, like... Uh, 26 Nintendo World Championship gold cards or something like that. So they're not going to, you know, only 26 people can potentially have that and not everybody's going to get it. But I'm just always amazed the price that people will pay. Like, there's no limit. Like, I want stuff too. But I'll be like, okay, well, I want to, I'm willing to pay up to X, but beyond that, like, it's just too much. And other people are like, no, I'll, I'll pay $5,000, $10,000, whatever it is. Like, I don't care because I must have this. Then, I, then you start to wonder, like, when does it, go beyond a hobby into an obsession. So I don't know. Now, I don't feel any ill will or badly about those people because, to me, to the victor go the spoils. And although I never paid ridiculous amounts, well, maybe once or twice, but I never paid, like, crazy amounts for anything that's in the collection for me, but I have been beaten by other people on who paid ridiculous prices for stuff, and I can't get mad at them. I don't like those people that get furious because they go, oh, well, you just throw all kinds of money around. It's like, well, you're just upset because you don't have the ability to be able to pay the amount of, you know, of of the price that the title bears. 
Yeah, no, listen, I don't get upset. If Listen, I have... If I didn't spend my money on anything except for my collection, I could I could have more things, right? But there's other things I want to spend money on um, and other things I need to spend money on. And I don't begrudge anybody who's rich and has a lot of disposable income to spend on whatever they want. I, it just surprises me that people don't have any type of ceiling on some things. It's just like, whatever it is, you know, no price is too great. That mentality, never, I never really fully understood, but that's just me. And I get it. I mean, and that's what I mean. Getting getting mad because you got beat out on an auction, I don't see anything unhealthy about that. But getting mad at the person that outbid you and then got and then basically go, well, you guys are a bunch of cheats because you have a lot of money, that doesn't make any sense in my mind. But I see people like that all the time. They get furious because somebody outbid them. And they're mad at the person, not mad at the situation. Yeah, there was one time I got upset with, with somebody, I don't remember who it was, but... And maybe it was just I was in a bad mood, but the, the situation was like, I felt like it was the eBay auction, and I felt like he so overpaid more than the thing was worth that I wasn't upset that I lost that item, but I felt like he screwed me over for the next five items also. <laughs> That's what I was upset about, because like, it's like those guys that do that, they don't they hurt everybody else down the road, too. I mean, like, and maybe it's to their benefit, because like everything, the price goes up with the thing that they own, but... You know, if that happens, then I get annoyed. But aside from that, I don't really care. And that's what I think is funny as well, because we all know each other, especially on eBay. You know your handles and things like that. So, I mean, I I will readily admit that there was a guy who outbid me on something twice in one day on two objects that I really wanted. And the second time it happened, I actually wrote on a piece of paper real big, you know, to the victor go the spoils. Well done. Congratulations. And then very small down in the corner, I drew a picture of a hand with its middle finger up and took a photo of it and mailed it to him, which he enjoyed. He appreciated it a lot. I'm realizing that our community must be fairly small. And <laughs> not only is the rest of our community be pretty small, but I think we found most of us because uh, I don't, can't tell you how many this twice this week. I bid on something that someone in our big box chat won. <laughs> it's like, and that's all, been that's been could, happening for years. Stewart can if we could that. just make a deal ahead of time, we'd all be paying le uh, lower prices. You and know? we actually we actually worked that out years ago in SW Collect. Sometimes a big title would drop and everybody'd be quiet about it, and then two days before the auction opens, before the auction ends, somebody would bring it up, and everybody's going. All right, who actually has the cash so we don't push the price up for this person? You know what I mean? And I have seen people go, "Well, I'll pay two hundred dollars for that. I'm gonna, I'm bidding two hundred and fifty. It's like, okay, go ahead. I'm not gonna raise it up anymore. Well, the the problem is, you saw what happened with that soft porn adventure recently. So, like, uh, no, which one? Tell the story. So what happened was someone in our group got together with some of his friends because they saw that a rare copy of Swarf Point Adventure was, was being auctioned. And they really wanted it, and they made an agreement that they're going to go in together as a consortium instead of actually bidding against each other. But the problem was because they were a consortium, they had more fun. So instead of like the maxing out, let's say, at $500, okay, and for $1,000, I don't think it's worth that much, but whatever, they were like, we got so much money in the pool, we're going to go up to $2,500. And anybody that, you know, if we get this thing, then we'll, we'll figure it out afterwards. Great. But what happened was there was some shill bidder or some fake bidder that overbid them and then ended up selling for like, I don't know, $4,000 or something like that. But it wasn't the real bid and he retracted, you know, he didn't pay. So the seller now thinks it's worth like four thousand dollars, and they contributed to this by raising the price artificially. They were they were the last actual real bid. So now the seller keeps on listing this item like buy it now, like thirty seven hundred, thirty six hundred, thirty five hundred. <laughs> He's like down to twenty five now. They don't want to bid at the twenty five because they know they probably like they could have got it for cheaper if they didn't do this thing. But they're trying to like they're playing a game of chicken now to see what if, you know when, when they can actually get the item. Hopefully they'll get it before someone else takes it. But that that was the problem with this consortium bidding is it actually screwed them up a little bit, you know. It's not like a bad idea. How are they possibly gonna gonna sort that out once they actually get the game in hand? It's gonna be a bloodbath. 
it was like that episode of The Simpsons where they uh, Bart and Milhouse went together for Radioactive Man Number One, and they ended up fighting over it and tore it up. <laughs> That's what I thought of when I heard the story. <laughs> because there is no honor among thieves. <laughs> exactly. So, anyway. These so, are the great the... stories. These these are the things, you know, whether I agree with them or not, or whether they leave a bad taste in my mouth or not, these are the things that keep my interest in the hobby, that I love hearing these stories, because I can, while I don't always agree with people's attitudes, I love passion in all of its forms. So it's really neat to hear these stories to go, there are other people like me in this world that would go, I have to have this. This is something I need for my collection. You know what I enjoy? And I'll, I'm going to be a jerk now and tell you what I enjoy. So, <laughs> Joel's already laughing. Recently I bought a copy of Commander Keen, which was like basically the first release. There was a disc and there was a piece of paper. And like I didn't pay the I haven't paid the big money for like all the box releases that people are paying big money for. Like there was Goodbye Galaxy that somebody had ten of them for one twenty nine. And in retrospect, maybe I should have bought it because it was not a bad deal. And they all sold out. And now, now people are trying to jack up the price on that. And Aliens, you know, uh, eat my babysitter is going for like other crazy prices and whatnot. But meanwhile, this is the the original release, and nobody knew about it. nobody to buy it because they just they're they don't have enough experience, you know. So I, I, I got something which I really wanted more than the other stuff because I had the knowledge and I was able to do some research and, and figure it out. I'm not sure if anybody else cares about this thing or not because maybe they're like, oh, there's no box, so therefore I don't care. It's not a box release. But if that's if that's the case, that's fine with me because I want to get what I want to get. If they want to get other things, good, good for them. But if they did want it afterwards, then, you know, that's fine with me too because, again, like, I believe in this, this is like, in some respects, is like the stock market. There are things that are undervalued. You know what you're doing. You can buy low and you can, you know, maybe sell high or maybe not sell at all, but you can buy low is the important thing. And I don't want to be there with it when, you know, they're, when they're auctioning off the Nintendo World Championship gold card. That's not for me. Let someone else do that. If I find it in a dumpster one day, great. If not, I can live without it, you know? Now, what did you pay for this Commander Keen original? Like 30, 40 bucks. And did you find any kind of backlash? Did people go, oh, my gosh, I can't believe it? Well, no, there was no backlash. Nobody said anything. I don't th I'm not sure if anybody cared, but I, actually what, what was cool about it was I wasn't sure it was the original release, so I sent a note to Tom Hall and asked him, and then he asked Scott Miller from Apogee, like, hey, you know, <laughs> and the consensus was, yes, this is the original release. There was no, there was no box. There was no nothing. This is it. So that, then there was a whole, like, uh, love fest that grew out of that post, which was, which was cool, but... Um. Yeah, like I don't. I'm not. I'm not here to compete with anybody. I'm just here to do this for fun, and for 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 me to have like a collection of the stuff that I think is is, is important and cool, and I like. Um. And you know, also the oh, much the better if other people don't know about these things. As far as I'm concerned. Until you win them, and then you'll let everybody know, and the price will go up ridiculously high, and you'll make a good profit. Theoretically, but it's not what I'm trying to do. <laughs> I know you're trying to bait me, but of course I am. But no, um, I know. But it's, I, I don't. I don't care about that, honestly. But I think this is really cool. I mean, that's part of the magic of it. That for some people, you go because I have a better education than you, and because I have a better eye, I can identify this kind of stuff. And you go and you snatch that stuff, and then because of your hard work, other people learn from that, and. Now the price will end up going up because of the great Stuart Feldhammer who had the eye to see that this is an original release. Well, I'm not joking. I'm not, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm serious. <laughs> Listen, it's not about the great Stuart Feldhammer. I, lo I, I do like educating people. Um, and that's, you know, not to be, to be like pedantic about it, but I, I do like helping people you know, learn things, let's put it that way, not schooling people or anything like that. It's not about education. It's about experience. I mean, it's it's sort of sad and pathetic, but I spend a lot of my brain cycles thinking about this stuff and researching it and playing these games, and I have a lot of collective experience for my you know many years in, on this this planet. So that's a that's it. See, I try I try very hard to uh, try to get things to catch on, and 
let me ask you a question. Do you know anyone else who has that original release? Not personally, but I'm sure there are people that have it. But probably not too many. Probably not. I would, I would guess that people that have it probably don't know that it's the original release. They're probably just going to chuck it. That's unfortunate. Now, what I think is really cool is that I tried to get this to catch on, and it kind of did and kind of did not. I wanted to start naming copies of ridiculously rare games after the original finder of them, like the, the Escape from Mount Drash is what I call the Fortran copy, because Fortran Dragon was the guy who spent years advertising, I want to find this game, if you have this game, let me know, I'll pay you for it, I'll pay you whatever you ask, I need this game, and he was putting up notations in the, in the news groups for years and years until he finally acquired the first known copy of it. And I refer to that as the Fortran copy, which actually went up for sale just recently, you know, and they want a lot of money for it. He didn't pay a lot, but I like the idea that that Commander King could be known as the Feldhammer copy. I think I'll pass on that, honestly. I'm not interested in that stuff. I would not make naming comments here or anything like that, but um, oh, I, I, don't, don't I know what you're saying. Yeah. You don't know. Does, does Fortran uh, Dragon still collect? Do you know? You know, I really don't know. Uh, he kind of dropped out of the scene for a long, long time. I haven't heard from him in a long, long time. So what he did, if I remember correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, he basically posted on news groups like every week saying, want to buy Ultima Escape from Mount Drash? We'll pay top dollar. And at that time, like nobody even was sure that it really existed. They weren't 100% sure. And then eventually after like years of posting this thing regularly, some guy was like, oh, hey, I got, you know, Ultima Escape from Mount Drash right here. And, that's correct. I mean, that's like, that's chutzpah. <laughs> I mean, that, he, he really wanted it badly. You know, I, I probably wouldn't do that because, honestly, like, if I was, and it paid off for him, but I'll tell you what, <laughs> if I wanted something really badly, I'd be afraid to advertise it. And I know with Pascal is the same thing because I'd be afraid that it would drive up the demand if I advertised it. I think in his case, one of the reasons that it worked is because people weren't even sure it ever existed, so they, they'd probably just like, ah, this is old Fortran is, you know, off his old crazy tricks again, you know, don't, don't, don't bother him, don't mind him. But in general, like, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do that. But it's pretty well, cool. In a situation like, you know, like our group, I mean, I advertise pretty heavily that I'm looking for Ultima 1, and I mean, if uh, you are aware that I'm looking for Ultima 1, you're going to be more likely to, you know, send me a link that, hey, look, this copy of Ultima 1 for 100 bucks, you know. And I wouldn't have that support system if I didn't let people know I was looking for it. Yeah, I don't think you understand the magnitude of what Stuart's talking about. This guy literally, once a week, put up a whole new post in the news groups, and he did this for like six years. I mean, that's dedication. It was quite a long time. <laughs> Very cool, though. But he got it. I mean, it paid off for him. He got his copy. How many copies of Drash are known to exist right now? Like three Less than a dozen, probably more than six. Uh, there's about the five complete that I know of. Five complete, you know, have you said? Yeah. And one of I them is the one that's, one of them is the one that's like that fell off a cliff. And is that the one you, uh, you have, or no? You don't. You have the. One, is that? The, I can't remember anymore. Uh, the one that fell off a cliff was complete, and that's a whole different story. It literally was thrown off of a cliff in ca in Canada for uh uh for in a landfill, and this guy used to go to the landfill and find cool stuff, and he brought a box of games home and stuck them in his basement for years and years. Then he would tell everybody, I, I have one, and it fell off the bottom of, I found it at the bottom of a cliff, and everybody kept telling him he was full of it until he decided to sell it. And it was in very bad shape. The box yeah. was in atrocious shape because it had been rained on and all that. But a game that, that's rare, that is that rare ended up commanding a pretty high price. So, I mean, let's be clear here. The we in our group, consistently talk about games that are monumentally more rare than the Nintendo World Championships gold card. <laughs> okay? Like, your, your Escape from Mountain Drash is potentially, 
and you're telling me there's only a dozen known to exist. Well, that's half as many of those stupid gold carts that even exist. Oh, no, no. Hold on, hold on, hold on. That's not true because the gold cart, there were 26 made. So there might be, I, think, there, I don't know, there may be only four or five copies out there also. There's only four or five that have been discovered. Yeah, theoretically there should be more than 26 trashes that were made. I, I don't know the exact number. I'm hoping it's more than 26. It's possible a lot of them were destroyed or thrown out, you know, who knows. But there might be more. But it, but in general, I agree with you. Like, the Nintendo World Championship Gold Card is the exception to the rule. In general, most of these things are, are, are very common, and there's a lot of PC games that are incredibly, incredibly, incredibly rare, but nobody cares about them at all. So <laughs> they, don't, they go for very cheap prices sometimes. Maybe so, I'll uh, refine my statement to say the NWC Grey Card. What do you think of that? There's yeah, more of the Grey Card than the Gold, I believe. How many great cards were there? I think like a couple hundred, a hundred or so at least. Definitely more than the gold. I think they were given to everybody who was in the contest. Yeah, you know how they got? They found. I know this is off topic for PC games, but you know how like they found like most of the gold cards that are out there. It was printed in Nintendo Power. Like these are the people that won the, the gold cards. So like people start calling these guys, like searching in the phone book for the guy's name and calling them up and say, hey. You don't want that gold card anymore. I'll give you like you know, I'll give you a hundred bucks for it. like really a hundred bucks. Like that's amazing. Like they probably took advantage of some of these people, but unfortunately for PC games, we don't have any records of like who has the drashes or anything like that. But <laughs> but I agree. There's definitely a lot of stuff that's really really. I mean, Jim Leonard used to always talk about this game Wib Arm, which I don't I don't I've seen it on eBay a couple times and it goes for pretty cheap. One claim it's like. Wibarm, W I B A R M. He says it's like incredibly, incredibly rare. Um, I'm searching my old email here. It says it sold less than 4,000 copies. Um, but nobody wants it. Nobody knows about it. Nobody cares about it. So therefore, it's it's cheap, you know. But until one day, maybe somebody will will want this game. Well, a lot of people don't realize that rarity is not definitely related to value. True, true. Yeah, I mean, you, know, you just got to look at that Uncle Henry's Playhouse to know that's true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in comics, badly, by the way. in comics, it's the same thing. There's like, you can get there are a lot of like comics that are not superhero comics that are that are pretty pretty rare, but nobody wants them. The only ones that have any collectability are the superhero comics, pretty much. But but Joe, there's there's one thing I wanted to say that I was thinking about you the other day. Um, where you're talking about people that grow up and get to a certain age and whatnot, what I've noticed recently is that the Infocom games are have gone down in price quite a bit. And based on what you said, what I'm thinking is the reason for that is that the people that cared about those things, are, are maybe some of them already have them or they moved on, and the, the collectors that are getting to the market now, they don't, they don't know about Infocom, they don't care about Infocom, was before their time... They don't want text adventures. So, like, there's a guy selling, I saw yesterday, a suspended mask version in box. Buy it now for, like, $199, which is not bad price. I, I can't remember in the past that would have been, like, snatched up very quickly. Correct. Right now it's sitting there, and there's I see lots of lots of folios, which used to be, like, folios, not the suspended or the, or the Starcross saucer, but, like, Enchanter, Sorcerer, Planetfall, Infidel, Deadline, um, those the, the Witness, those used to be Sea Stalker. They used to be harder to find. And if you go on eBay now, you'll find like 30, 20 or 30 copies of them for relatively cheap prices, and people are not buying them. So I find that very interesting, first of all, and I wonder what else will fall out of favor you know, as the time goes on. Well, my theory behind that is that we're at the next generation now. When when those prices were very high for all of those folios, it was 25 to 30 years after these people all grew up. So basically, it's usually 20 to 25 years in my opinion. So when people reach the age of 35, what was ex what was desirable to them shoots up in price because now I've got a job and kids and I'm pretty stable and I have a little extra spare cash flow. Now those people all got theirs. Now they're 50. They think that it's going to raise in price like, 
like gold, and it's not. It's going to fluctuate like anything else. I mean, uh, you see a whole lot of them on there because the kids of today don't, you know, the 35-year-olds of today don't want those because they were not the games of their generation. Over a long, long span, yes, they're going to be valuable in my opinion because they were the cutting edge and they were the very beginning of the video game era. So they're going to be worth money, some of the very first titles. Uh, I also think that some of the greatest titles in the world are going to be worth money as well. Those ones that everybody says, this is a timeless classic. The guys that are collecting Doom right now are literally paving the way for when they're 60 years old. We could end up seeing that that whole thing happen in the PC game collectors thing where there's a Sotheby's auction that specializes in computer games. It's possible. I mean, I, I used to collect comics, so one thing I noticed there is that a couple things. One is that there were always hot titles, and things went up and down in a cyclical fashion based on what was hot at that point in time. And especially there were things that came out that, you know, for five years they were very expensive and they went down like to zero because nobody cared about them anymore. And then there was sort of like the, the key books that they called them that always went up. Also like your action comics number one, your detective number 27, you know, all the, all the key issues. Um, but I'm not sure how that translates into computer game collecting because... Like, I would think, like, Infocom to me is, like, key stuff, but, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't have a direct enough connection to what came after it. So, like, Superman, Action Comics number one, Superman has been published continuously since 1938. I think Correct. 19. So he's been published continuously since then. So people like Superman today, like, yeah, sure, I'd love to get the first appearance of Superman, but there's no connection like that. There's no common characters that really go through most video games. So... You know, I might like Doom and not give a, you know at all crap about anything else before that. But the correct the correct answer is you're right. There have not been any longevity characters yet, and there there certainly are. I mean, I'm sorry, but Mario has yeah. been going on for thirty years. Uh, uh, you know, there, there are a couple of those. There's yeah, right. Mario. In there's the console there's, world. What? In the console world. There is a lot of them. Sure. And Ultima is one of those titles. It went on for 20 years, and fingers crossed, we'll get to see another one someday. And it'll be added to the series. But uh, it, it really all depends. And what I'm saying is that 50, 60, 75 years from now, people will be looking back on these, saying these are, you know, classic examples of, you know, of, of classic video game or computer game artwork and stuff like that, you know, taken from the origin catalog. Yeah, one thing which also worries me a little bit in terms of if I if, if in terms of resale value is the shrink wrap thing, because it, you know it's just like in comic books, there's grades and things like that. Now they're starting to do some nonsense like that with with the games. And to some extent, there are some, you know, there's, there's definitely a huge premium that people pay for these shrink-wrapped games. So my guess is that in the common games, like the Doom and things like that, when I say common, they're, they are pretty common. They're not like... Okay, Doom is maybe not so common because you just get to mail a die to its software to get it. So it's not that common, actually. But I mean, that's a bad, good example. But for some of these more common games, there's a lot of them out there, and probably what's going to end up being the ones that the collectors will really want in the future will be the sealed ones, is my, is my guess. But other titles that are not so common, even just to have a copy of it is, is hard to find. So, I don't know. I guess we'll see. Well, I mean, and that's what's going to end up happening, in my opinion, because many of the titles that we have are not in the best of shape. But like comic books, if it's a ridiculously rare title and it's really, really hard to find, I mean, I've seen those guys that literally take old comic books and they will paint <laughs> little sections over the cover, and you know what I'm talking about, to where yeah. they're so good at their craft that you can't tell, and then they have, and then they improve the quality and the price jumps up because they've been restored. Right, but then when the, when they get graded by like the CGC, 
they have like two different color labels, like the blue labels for unrestored and purple is for restored. So they always more tell you this is restored. It's like a cubic zirconia almost. I mean, it's not exactly the same because this is a real item, but it's like this is not really pristine like you think it is. It's, don't be fooled. This is this is true, and unfortunately, this happens with all collections. But what you've seen in regard to cubic zirconia, you know, when you see the, the I mean, for heaven's sake, they're selling they're selling a, a, a yellow diamonds now. I mean, the ones that everybody thought were crap now, they're objects they desire because De Beers just told you this is what you want. Right. I was reading for diamonds. It's like they have so. I don't know if this is true, but they have so many of them like under chocolate. the ground. Chocolate is what they call it. Yeah, they can make like they can make them like there's no tomorrow, but they purposely like restrict the supply and try to make you think it's really rare and whatnot. But well, that's what cracks me up is that they spin this stuff. I mean, now they say that emeralds are becoming more desirable in flawed condition because that shows that they're original emeralds. They're, they developed a process in the late 1970s where they superheat really lousy emeralds. They find the ones that nobody wants. If they put them in a kiln and superheat them to like a ridiculous temperature, all of the imperfections disappear and they become pure. And they're completely 100% indistinguishable from a naturally occurring pure emerald. So the price just started fluctuating like crazy because nobody can decide whether, you know, having one that's been fired is what they call it, you know, is uh, as valuable or more valuable or less valuable than an original. And that's all going to balance out. And it all come down to, you know, uh, the pop Mervis down in the, in the mines, you know, you know, making the decision that this is what you want. And once they do, the market basically stabilizes and balances out. I had uh, there's a I showed it earlier at a previous thing. I have a, a, a copy of a record album called The Beatles Yesterday and Today. Has anybody heard about the Butcher cover at all? No. No. It's a it's a rare Beatles album that the cover of the album has a picture of the Beatles in bloody butcher smocks holding chunks of meat and decapitated baby doll heads. This is for real. This is not this is not made up. Well, they released this album in 1966 and it was the first album that had the song Yesterday on it. And the radio DJs got their advanced copies and wrote into Capitol Records and basically said, this is disgusting and this is horrible and this is atrocious and we want it taken off of the record store shelves. So Capitol did this big giant uh, uh, recall of all these albums and then spent two weeks replacing the covers and sticking pastovers over the records of the picture of the Beatles in a, a steamer trunk you know, standing around an old steamer trunk. And a pair, these original copies are worth tens of thousands of dollars, especially sealed, because some of them actually were sold. And then there are pastover ones. Well, as soon as everybody found out about it, they spent a lot of time trying to steam off that cover with an iron to get back to the original cover. I, I tell this story specifically because it's now come to the point where so many people have steamed off that original, that secondary cover to get to the original, that the secondary covered ones are worth more than a steamed off copy. Because everybody did it. Mine has not been steamed. I just put it in a frame and put it away. But they're actually worth more because they haven't been monkeyed with at all. There are professional companies on the internet that will steam the album cover off for you and charge you $1,500 or whatever it is. I think that's exactly what I mean, and you're bringing full circle to what I said at the beginning. If you're just doing this because you want something that other people have, there's a problem in my mind. I mean, like, you shouldn't care what's more desirable, the steamed or the not steamed or whatever. You should be caring what you want, not like what someone else wants you to want. I guess that's my main point. Correct. And I did not get my cover steamed off 
for any other reason other than the fact that I love the idea of having that framed album cover in my house and it's only happened twice out of all the people that have come through my house there have been two single people that I completely forget it's there and it's wonderful that if another true fan comes in they'll give it a glance and I was so pleased because it was an electronic arts representative that came to the house to look at the museum and he walked by and he literally like in the movies stopped and went is that what I think it is? And I'm like uh huh <laughs> You know, so you find another true fan, you know what I mean? It's like a grail quest. That it's like, you are a true seeker of the Deathly Hallows if you know what that is. And I don't advertise it, it's just a picture on the wall. But once in a while it brings me great joy when somebody walks by and goes, oh my gosh, that's a butcher cover, isn't it? You know, <laughs> so it's neat. That's awesome. And by the way, you're smarter than most of those other guys because, like, you learn in like uh, finance, like if you have an option, don't exercise the option unless you have to. It's worth more if unexercised. So like, why don't you just steam it off now? You can always steam it off later. You're better off the way you did it. Just left it alone. <laughs> Correct. Right. It's and and that's the way I feel about all the stuff that I've collected over the years. You know, I I can't have those regrets because I got to admit, ten percent of the museum I've given away over the years. And then I start to kick myself because I go, that was worth 400 bucks, And the guy told me it wasn't worth all that much, and he traded me some stupid $30 game for it. But then I think and I go, you know what? I'm passing it back out to everybody else and keeping this dream alive. If it wasn't for me and you and Joel, people might not remember Ultima anymore. You know? You know, you know what that reminds me of? I, I, like I, said, I, I used to collect comics. I collected certain types. One comic which I did not collect was Spider-Man, but I had some Spider-Man comics that I bought, whatever. And one of the comics that I bought, like you know, back in the day, was I think it was the comic where either where Peter Parker proposed to Mary Jane or the one where she accepted the proposal, which was two different issues. An amazing Spider-Man. And someone came to my house who was like a, not a friend, but like an acquaintance, and he's like, "Oh man, that's so cool! Like you have that." And I, it it wasn't really like. It wasn't always something I bought as part of my collection. It was something I bought to read. And I said to him, like, you know, if you want it, you can have it. It's yours. So I gave it to him. And then afterwards, my brother said, what, you're so stupid. Like, that was worth money and whatever else. And I was like, yeah, but, I mean, I didn't really need it. I didn't really want it badly. He, he obviously really wanted it desperately. I wasn't going to sell it to him. Like, it wasn't that worth that much. And I'm not in this to like hoard things that I don't want. I mean, you know, I I do this because I like to do it. You know, so I think it's the same thing. And if you don't, do, if you're not doing it because you like it, because you love, because you love it really, if you're not collecting because you love these games, then you probably should be doing something else. If you want to invest, go play the stock market. Now here is the final rub, though. You gave that copy to your friend, right? If you bumped into your friend in the supermarket tomorrow and said, whatever happened to that, if he said, that's the pride and joy of my collection and I actually had it framed and I had it sealed and it's really nice, you would continue shopping for your milk and cheese and go, that's really cool. Yeah. But if his reply was, you know that's what, enough. I popped that up on eBay about a year later and made $400 off of it. You'd go and buy your bread and cheese and want to destroy the entire dairy department because this guy really didn't care about it. He was after the darn money. Am I right or am I wrong? I would think he was, think he was a low life, but yeah. <laughs> That's the part that breaks my heart more than anything. You get tricked into believing that someone else desires it because they share the same passion that you do, and you find out in the end they're after the money, and that's it. And you start going... You know, that's really flipping sad. I can walk away from a bad trade if I'm confident that that person is going to make it the jewel of their collection. I love that thought and that feeling. But if you're just in it because you want to make the most money, good luck to you. I don't want to talk to you. I'm with you. What do you think, Joel? You've been pretty quiet. You're probably surfing eBay while we're talking. Yeah, I was looking up this uh, butcher cover of the Beatles, and it is very disturbing. Excellent. I think I think now that we've had that conversation, Stuart, I think that Joel might want to give you that red box just because he knows how much you really want it. 
I don't think so. Get it to him, but he wouldn't have the story. You know, like uh, it's not the box that means something to me. It's uh, the you know me talking to him on Facebook and you know him hitting his goals and me you know being like yeah that's cool and then going and seeing him in, at Dragon Con and shaking his hand and him giving me the box and signing it and everything it's the story behind it that's cool not the not the physical object that is a that's a fantastic transition you know for I think you're both cool by the way but I think it's worth much more to you than it is to me I think that's I would agree completely about that keep your mouth shut I'm working for you man <laughs> uh, come on <laughs> So, so Joel, I don't, I don't have anything to show and tell today. But are you guys going to do any show and tell for me, or no show and tell this week? <laughs> I showed uh, Savage Empires earlier. I hold it up. Oh, I just yeah. step away for five minutes. Um, oh, and then I was going to show my, uh, which I kind of showed before, but my my snarf thing, which you already <laughs> saw. But um, <laughs> which could be yours if the price is right. <laughs> yeah, uh, ten thousand dollars, Stuart. This could be a year. No, I don't know. Uh, just That's a, mean. This uh, snarf thing. I mean, I know that we're. You know, it's it's definitely not a super popular comic book character in the modern day and age. But like, I spent my childhood reading these comics. You know, that's like part of the reason why I was so jazzed up about making sure that trying to make sure that this this Kickstarter happened because. Um, I kind of I like the idea of uh, new people that don't know anything about it um, getting into it or you know discovering comics, going back and reading them. Because uh, I spent many a day as a young lad reading Starf comics and Wormy and all those other things that were in Dragon Magazine. All yeah, right, if a, you wanna, if you wanna uh, actually, okay, can I do a show in town now? Go ahead, go ahead. I'm quite literally picking things at random off my table. I don't know if I've ever shown this before, but this is a this is a binder that I actually got through Origin Systems. Have I ever shown this to anyone? Mm -hmm. This is called that. Point of Origin. This is just a binder that everybody that they put together uh, in house because it is their in house newsletter, and I have. Uh, multiple copies of these things, uh, one of which I actually gave to Stuart once, that basically Origin had its own in-house uh, newsletter that it would go through. They were nice enough to give me basically the master copy, so every single one that they've ever made is in this, is in this binder, going all the way back to, heck, what would it be? Oh gosh, I'm not even sure. It's basically like 1994. And every single copy of it goes through and they talk about what's happening in the industry. This is information on James. Here's information on new management coming in. Uh, people's birthdays, so you get to know all the developers, you get to know what's going on in the office, you get to know people's pride and people's uh, anger and people's frustration on things as well. Uh, plus the inside jokes in the office and things like that. A lot of times there are Q&As in these things where you hear origin developers getting horribly angry about uh, the phone system and developers and artists and things like that, but people actually getting mad. I'm trying to find a, an example, but you find out all these little fun facts, such as when Origin moved to their last set of offices, it apparently was tradition that Richard Garriott's extension at Origin was 666. He intentionally asked for that every single time a phone system came in so that he was, you know, he was the mark of the beast if anybody wanted it. Uh, while I've never questioned it before and never bothered to ask, 
I would hazard to guess that if there's an automated telephone system in the Portolarium offices, I probably know what Richard's extension would be. If I ever knew the phone number, I would try that just to see if he picked up. That's very, very cool, Joe. And it's, and it's, it's not only really cool, you, did you scan these or something, or someone scan them? They're online, correct? One of my friends actually scanned them here in the museum and posted them. Uh, so they're on the Wing Commander News site, and they're also on the uh, Ultima Codex website. So you can see every single issue of Point of Origin, you know, and that's what I think is wonderful. That's another that's another point to be made. Collecting is not all about hoarding, as we all know. When I get this kind of stuff, one of the big thrills that I have is to distribute it to the world. Any paperwork or documentation that I get, I like to scan it and just give it out to anybody who wants it. And that keeps the hobby alive. It keeps people fresh. It keeps it gives you new ideas to go back and try to find other things, you know. Sometimes I wish I had watermarked some of them because once in a while I'll get a, an email from someone going, hey, I found these really rare photographs that you might want to buy. They're only $100 a piece. And you look at them very closely and go, no, I have the originals. I scanned them. I put them out on the Internet. And then you printed a couple and you're trying to sell them to me for 100 bucks a piece. Thanks, but I don't think I will. Do you actually sell it to, say that to the guy or you just ignore him? That has happened multiple times, and I used to ignore them, and now I literally go, you know, it's strange. I find it funny. I'm, I'm not really sure where you got these, but the originals actually came from my house, and, you know, those are printed digital copies, and they always say the same thing. Oh, I didn't know that. I'm sorry about that, and then I never hear from them again. So basically, I see, I see people trying to scam all the time, probably two, three times a year. Somebody tries to sell me my own stuff back. I, mean, I think we, in a way, we have a responsibility to um, future generations. As I mean, we're essentially leaders, and you know, we're, we're establishing ourselves as leaders in the hobby. And we have a this kind of goes back to the Feldhammer copy of uh, um, uh, thing. I mean, well, you may not want that, Stuart, but in a way, it's it's our responsibility as. Um, uh, stewards of the hobby to go ahead and do that because there's going to come a time when none of us are around and they're going to need to know whether that's the, the Feldhammer copy of you know Commander Keen or not. It's just like that Calabeth that's like a complete fake. You know, you need you need to be able to track that stuff and uh, that's useful information. Well, the fact that I plan on being around forever basically makes it makes it safe because when Stuart finally kicks the bucket, I'll be able to identify that copy when it comes around, you know. Anything you guys want me to put in the will, let me know, like, you know, just as, I'm going to put a codicil that says, if foul play is discovered, then everything is null and void. <laughs> My will is going to say, Joel does not get the following items. And then... <laughs> I just want a cat P Ultima One. Just will me that and I'll be fine. Done and done. So what else? Anything else interesting this last couple weeks that we want to talk about? I yeah. know that there is interesting news for uh, hopefully future uh, hangout. We're we're all busily getting special guests. Yeah, hoping that that comes through for sure. Without without revealing without revealing the big reveal, or the surprise <laughs> being the surprise, we will have special guests coming up. That'll be a fun that'll be a fun day for sure. Um, the uh, Divinity Original Sin Two Kickstarter's got 16 days to go, and it's at 1.4 million dollars. That's a collector's edition that I snatched up. Whenever it first came out, out. Um, so, you actually reminded me of something I wanted to talk about. Kickstarter. This is like my my pet peeve lately. I spent a bunch of time on this yesterday. There's all these games that get funded by Kickstarter, and I don't hear about it until it's already done. 
And so in some cases I hear about it two months after the Kickstarter is over, and some cases I hear about it when the game's released. And then it was like, oh yeah, the successful Kickstarter for this game, blah, blah, blah. And the only way to get a physical copy was during the Kickstarter in some cases, and in other cases it, actually, it does get a retail release, but there's a much better copy available to the Kickstarter backers. Um, so aside from my other pet peeve, which is people that don't actually produce the physical rewards, <laughs> um, it's just really annoying that I'm, I spend like a lot of time tracking down things that I didn't know about to pledge for, and these things are going to end up being more rare than the Nintendo World Championship gold cartridge because in some cases there are only like 10 guys who signed up for the physical release, and they made 10. So I don't know what you guys think about that, but it's it's very annoying to me. It's not like... I have a similar situation where, what's that game, Pillars of Eternity, what was the name of that game? Yeah, Did I get that right? I would, have, I would have backed that in a heartbeat, man, and uh, I didn't even know it existed, you know? And I'm usually pretty up on this stuff, and that one, for some reason, flew right under my radar. I don't know why. No one just no one said anything about it the whole time I was, it was up. So, yeah, I, I feel your pain on that. I don't know where well, you really imagined. Now, my personal opinion is that is that you should never say die. I mean, Stuart, we are those crazy guys that go ridiculously out of our way to try to obtain these objects they desire. Why don't you automatically just decide to make an extra effort in that? Give me an example. What game are you? What game specifically are you kicking yourself for that the Kickstarter is over on? You know, it's not one game specifically. It's it's a lot of games. Well, give me an example. Fine. This, this is not the best example, but Divinity Original Sin. Um, and the reason why I say it's not the best example is because what I was going to say to Joel about Pillars of Eternity is that one actually you can you shouldn't be kicking yourself too much because that so many people got box copies of. I think a lot of people bought it just to support uh, you know Fergus or his name, how you pronounce his last name, um, and they they sell them on eBay. There's, there's a lot of them on eBay actually. I mean they're they're expensive, but they're also expensive to back it, so I think you can get that without too much of a premium for, for coming in late. But there are other games that they were only, like I said, a few copies made. Like, Divinity Original Sin is somewhere in between, because the Divinity Original Sin 2 Kickstarter is going like crazy. But the first one, I think, didn't do that well just because the first two games they made, Divinity, like, I guess Divine Divinity and Divinity 2, whatever it was called, those games didn't get very good reviews. They were very mediocre reviews. And this game, I don't think anybody expected anything from it. And then when it was came out and got amazing reviews, that's when all of a sudden everybody started wanting it, and that's why the new Kickstarter is doing so well. But it's not so easy to find copies because, not the, not the relatively speaking, not as many people backed that last Kickstarter at high enough levels, and those people that did were more hardcore, and they're not going to you know, give up their stuff so easily. And then there's stuff which is much more obscure than that, like... I was looking for a game called um, Section 13. Is that what it's called? I'm trying to remember. Um, section, I think Section 13 or Sector 13. I think it's sec Sector 13. Section, I don't know. I'll, I'll find it later. But You must not want it that badly if you can't even remember the name of it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> the guy that designed that game, um, he used to be like the, the lead designer at Delphine Software, and he was the, head, the lead designer of the game Flashback, and also um, Future Wars and a number of their adventure games. And they did a, a Kickstarter for another adventure game, which I didn't see the Kickstarter until it was done. And that game is, is at the point where it got a physical release in Germany, um, with which which is an English release. It's not a uh, it, it, it's subject thirteen. It's not it's not a it's an English it's an English release but with German packaging and German manual. Um, so I could go ahead and go buy that, but I'd much rather have the Kickstarter version, which for sixty dollars they were giving a copy basically signed by by the designer, <laughs> which is a pretty good deal. And yeah, and the game was called Subject Thirteen. I couldn't remember it before. But that's just that's just one example. I mean, I wrote them a, a note and you know trying to see if maybe I could you know still get a copy somehow. But um, and I said like I'll go buy that one if I have to. But that's not my preference. But there's literally like 50 other games like that that I have the same issue with. 
But, but what is to stop you from sending a handwritten letter to that developer saying, I missed the Kickstarter, I'm back in your new one, I think this is wonderful and terrific, but what I've been looking for more than anything is, and then list out that thing. If there are any in the warehouse, if there's any in your offices, if there's an extra copy anywhere, I would be I would be delighted beyond belief if you were to get that yeah. to me. I'll be happy to pay whatever it is you ask for it and like that. It all depends on how badly you want it. More often than not, the developers have 15 or 20 different copies floating around in their offices just sitting in the back of a closet. If you need it and you have to have it and you want it badly enough, if you write a nice handwritten letter and go through the whole thing and show them that you're a fan, you might end up getting it. That's actually a possibility because I was at a booth at Dragon Con called Cool, cool Mini or Not. They make board game, miniature based board games and stuff. And they're big on Kickstarter. They do Kickstarters all the time. Every Kickstarter they put up makes over a million dollars and they produce board games. Well, they had uh, bought a copy of their game Zombie Side, which is a very popular game, and they had the Kickstarter rewards in a, in a glass case that if you spent a certain amount of money, they were giving them away for points. So basically, they had the Kickstarter rewards just, they had a warehouse full of them, like what Joe's saying, and they're bringing them to conventions and, and using them as a sales tool. So yeah, they've got tons of this stuff uh, laying around, probably, because they get cut deals when they print like a million boxes versus like 500,000 and stuff and they just they probably have tons of them so i've tr i've i've done it in some cases not in others so first of all there's a case which i think i mentioned a couple times in the past where i actually backed something <laughs> and i didn't get it because the guy mailed it to my house and i'd moved right around that time and they didn't forward the mail and someone probably stole it and i kind of the guy said i'm really sorry but i only made exactly enough Copies and he's a very you know small batch or whatever and and I and I that's pretty frustrating also but in some cases I do like I did email that guy yesterday the, the subject thirteen game that I was just met talking about in that case you know I try that in other cases honestly I wouldn't do it um, and the divine divinity original sin is a good example because I know a lot of people want it and maybe this is just this is probably being stupid but I don't I don't like to be like a schnorrer, <laughs> um, like a beggar. Like I don't like I don't like going to some guy like secretly. You know, you know everybody wants it. and People pay a lot of money, but I'm gonna like I, I have a bright idea, so I'm gonna go around everybody's back and and go to this guy and like ask him personally, and maybe he'll give it to me. But I would feel bad about it because I, I don't know I, I I can't explain it. I mean I, I don't want I don't want I don't want to I don't want to be like. I guess I don't want to be a beggar is the is the way to say it. I, remember, I got mine as a slacker backer. They were selling these on their website. Um, I don't remember how much I paid for it, but this this was shipped to me in like this weird box that was like uh, had a it's like someone hand shipped it or something. It was strange. It was it had the form on the front. From, it was came from like Denmark or something. But uh, it's got some cool stuff in here. It's got a that's interesting by the way. That, you know, that version that you just showed, that's not the Kickstarter edition. Is it not? No, because they, they, they published in the store the exact same thing, which is that, which you have. And as far as I can tell, it's exactly the same in every respect, except yours says collector's edition. That's what they published in the store. And the one that they actually gave to the backers, it says Kickstarter edition. Oh, really? That's the only difference. <laughs> so they mark mark and everything. I'll post you a link in the chat. There is one guy right now. I think it's everything is the same. There is one guy on eBay right now that has a copy of the actual Kickstarter edition, but it's it's way overpriced. Who does it come with? Because this one came with uh, came with some in-game stuff, the manual, soundtrack, two-sided poster, which is really cool. Um, the two copies of the game on Steam, which is what me and Heather were after. It was nice that they gave two copies. I love that. Uh, stickers, map of the a cloth map, and a bunch of cards. So this yeah, is. What... I, th I think I think it's exactly exactly the same, mm -hmm. except to, you know, to, so that so that the Kickstarter one would actually be unique. They just changed that. I just put you a link in the in the chat. Click on that and you'll see what I'm talking about. That yeah, Kickstarter one will be worth a lot more. Only yep. people know about it because I just let the cat out of the bag, I guess. 
Oh well, yeah, this the, this art of book and all the stuff that they got with it didn't come. I don't have all no, that. That's st that stuff is extra, like you know, higher tiers. Don't worry about that. But look at the actual box. Yeah, Kickstarter. It's the exact same box, exact size it's and exactly everything. Exactly. Fascinating. But it's not unusual whatsoever to desire a box that has one small thing that's different on it. I mean, that's common in our in our little groups. I think the Here most they even bother to print the boxes up. But I believe that the most useful bit of information in the last half hour is quite literally knowing that Schnorr is the Yiddish word for beggar. <laughs> um, by the way, I'll put out the call right now that uh, if anyone finds a cheap copy of Pillars of Eternity, send me a link. <laughs> <laughs> what do you define as cheap? I don't know. I'd probably 50 to 100 bucks. If you just want the disc, you can get it for, for that cheap. You want yeah, the collector's edition. Again. If you want the collector's edition, you got a problem. Yeah, I'm seeing that on eBay right now. <laughs> I've got a big problem. Well, man, my point is, is that, I mean, we, I'd love to have that one, man. It just sucks. The oh, whole point is, is that we, we talked in a previous uh, hangout about, you know, the, the top ten ways to basically to help your hobby and that kind of stuff. And these are the ways that I get those objects. And nobody ever brought that up. So literally, there's a lot of power in a handwritten letter to make, you know, to make somebody stand up and pay attention to what's going on. Just because, I mean, anybody, and I will admit everybody, shoots emails out to various people to actually put pen to paper, get some nice quality paper stock, Mail it in an envelope. You know, it, it, it does wonders for the hobby, and nobody ever picks up on that. Yeah, but I don't think I explained before what I was trying to say. I, I have in the past emailed developers. When I've done that is in cases where the game is very obscure, nobody's heard of it. I, I'm one of the only people that knows it exists probably, and I'm like, hey, you know, do you have any clue where I can get a copy? But we were talking before, and I won't mention the name of the game, about, well, some, well I guess you showed before, a box that people wanted or whatever, and there's only a few of them, and someone said, why don't I message the guy? Well, you know, I could message the guy, but the guy knows I want it already. Now, I could be like a pain in the ass. I'm like, say, hey, please, please, I really want it, please. But you know what? I don't, first of all, it's a little bit degrading, but aside from that, I don't feel like I deserve it so much more than anybody else that I should go do that and, like, play these games. Like, I don't, it just feels wrong to me. I don't, I don't want to do that. I, I agree, it, it, but it all depends on, you know, how ham-handed you are! You don't want to end up like a snorer and just beg for that. Yeah, kind of stuff. You know these guys that these guys that produce uh, rare things that people want. They know that you want it. That's the whole reason that they're making this stuff. So you don't have to feel degraded. By, I mean, to the what was uh, Joe said a few minutes ago to the victor go the spoils. I mean, you got to play the game sometimes, you know, to get get your hands on some of this stuff. I'll give you another example. There's a game. Um, Called there was a Kickstarter that came out like a year or two ago, called The Ballads of Remus Two, which is a point-and-click adventure game, and I never heard of it at the time, mostly because I don't play games that are online usually. So if, if I could download it and play it later, I sometimes will. But if it's like you have to play it on on this website, I usually don't bother. And I guess this guy had created a lot of games in this series that were all on a website, and then. He created one called The Ballads of Remus, which was available for purchase on hard copy. He made 100 copies. Now, apparently, and he sold them for like 10 bucks each. Apparently, he couldn't give them away. He was, like, trying to sell them, but, like, the word was not getting out to the right people. And eventually, you know, he managed to trickle out, like, the last copy, you know, after, like, reducing the price and you know, throwing in a T-shirt and I'm not sure what else. Um, but eventually, he sold them. By the time I got around to that Kickstarter, they were all gone at that point. And I would love, I would still love to have what I don't. I don't have a copy. There's one site I go to on the forums where somebody posted one time. It's like I don't, I don't go there. Like it's funny, I don't go to this site like once a year maybe. And I happened to go on the site one time, and the, and the day before that, someone had posted, "I have a copy of this game. If anybody wants it, like you know, I'll give it to you for twenty bucks." And like, like, like you know, ten hours later, someone was like, "You're sure I want that?" And, he, and it was you know, done. I was like, "Damn, why didn't I see that one?" But a lot of times it's like it's not like these guys are be having their door being banged down to get a copy of the game. Like 
nobody wants it except for like a couple of people that don't know about it. And then once they find out, it's like too late already. So I don't know. Again, another example of a, of a frustrating situation. But I guess if there was no frustrating situations like that, it, this would all be too easy and probably no fun. So that's very true. <laughs> yeah, that's like the thrill of the hunt. Absolutely. And the thrill of the hunt is what keeps us in this, you know, in this hobby more than anything. I mean, for me, I'm not as passionate as you guys, and I don't want to sound like, like a jerk, but it's because I pretty much got everything that I could ever have wanted. And anything that I still want is so ridiculously rare that it'll never end up happening. I mean, what are the things that I still desire for the museum? Heck, I want I want the I want the actual spaceship from the Wing Commander movie. Am I going to get that? No, there's one of them. It's in Planet Hollywood. It's actually it's actually in storage right now, or no, it's in England right now. Somebody ended up trying to sell it, but what the heck am I going to do with it? You know. But that would complete my Wing Commander collection. You might get that because I don't know if anybody else wants it. <laughs> Maybe one day they'll be like, we're throwing this thing out. Well, that was half That was half the acquisitions in the museum now, is that people were getting rid of it and going, we don't want it. I mean, who is it? I mean, for heaven's sakes, uh, Prince Thrakath, who actually you can't see very well, but he's right over there, was just donated because they were probably going to throw it away. Yeah. And that, in my opinion, was one of the greatest full motion video games that has ever been created. You know, Wing Commander 3, it's the, sorry, it's the Wizard of Oz of its time. And in 20, 30, 40 years, that's going to be looked at as one of the big games in history. It's definitely up there. My opinion, you know, because they were the ones that got the real decent B actors instead of we hired one B actor and then a bunch of extra people around the office did voiceovers. You know, I mean, they spent good money on this kind of stuff. And it was popular. You know, I liked Wing Commander 3, but I like on my list of top games, I'll put even Wing Commander 1 higher because I like the, the, the actors, and, and I mean, they had amazing actors, clearly, and it's a great game, but... Like, Wing Commander 1, when it came out, was, like, an amazing, groundbreaking, revolutionary thing for me, and I loved it so much because of that. And Wing Commander 3 was an evolution of the same concept, I think, at least. But anyway, it was still it was a great game, regardless of which one's better. Absolutely. Now, Stuart, what would you actually pay to have the original asteroid that was scanned and used in the production of Wing Commander 1. <laughs> There's really an asteroid that they scanned? There really is an asteroid that they physically scanned <laughs> to be used as one of the, as all of the asteroids <laughs> in Wing Commander 1. You know? That's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I don't know that I would pay anything for it, but I mean, I can imagine someone else paying a lot for it. Right. I mean, now, I would probably pay a ridiculous amount of money for it. I know, or I've been told, that it is in the possession of Chris Roberts right now, and that it was actually a lava rock that was taken off the driveway at Origin. They went and found an unusual-looking rock, put it on a scanner, and literally made the 3D model from it. So he has the original. He said he doesn't know where it is anymore. But it's in his possession. It's in a box somewhere in his house. But my point is, is that I would give anything to put that in a little glass case and go, this is the rock used for blah, blah, blah. Nobody else would, but I would go crazy over it. Me and two other people would probably go, I'd do anything to put that in my hand. That's very cool. And that's, a, that's the thing, exactly. It doesn't matter if other people want it or not. Like, Listen, if I if I had that rock, I would certainly preserve it and keep it, and I'd probably give it to you. But <laughs> I mean, it, it wouldn't mean you know the same to me. Like, I, part of the reason for that is like I just have set limits on what I will collect and what I won't. Your collection is a lot of non-game items, like things that are like promo items and related to games. 
I don't have too much of that in my collection because I I tried to restrict it for for cost reasons, you know, because your your collection is more narrow than mine in terms of the game, you know, perspective. Um, but so that's why I wouldn't want it. But yeah, there, there, I can imagine things like that that I would be like, oh my god, this is amazing for some other full motion video adventure game, you know. The, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but uh, maybe the sword they used to return to Zork or something like that. Right. Um, I actually got to meet a guy who was best friends with the guy who played Sub-Zero in the original Mortal Kombat game, and he still had the costume. And I, like, lost my mind going, I got to talk to this guy. And we parted ways, and I never heard from the dude again, but it was one of those things that what I would give to get Sub-Zero's costume from the original darn game. It was an Atari game back in the day that is kind of a side uh, segue, but uh, remember that Sword Quest, Earthworld, and Sword Quest, all those games? There was, yeah. these, uh, you remember there was these, these contests, the whole game were, were about these contests. I was watching some videos on YouTube about the items. Like, I guess that they only actually ever produced two games before Atari went belly up, and uh, the Earthworld, they was like a, like a really solid gold, like trinket thing. And at the end, they were going for the sword at the end, but um, no one really knows where the sword is located at. There's like this gold sword with jewels inlaid on it, and they think that the CEO of Atari at the time still has that sword. But um, there's these, anyway, it was an interesting thing. Look it up sometime if, you've got, if you're a viewer and don't know about the Sword Quest stuff. It's very fascinating. I think there was three games made out of the four, if I remember correctly, but only two of the contests took place. And Water World was kind of is very numbers. rare. Like Water World is like basically impossible to find because it, it came out right when the whole thing went went to crap. Yeah, and I remember reading that also that, that the CEO. I think the CEO was. Um, I think it was the guy from Commodore, wasn't it? Jack Tremiel. Jack Tremiel. Yeah, he he took over Atari if I remember correctly. I think there have was, been fans that have bugged his own children to say. Where's the sword? <laughs> and cool. even now, anytime I see an interview with Jack Tramiel, and he does a lot of interviews today from his house, I'm always looking in the background, always, because I'm yeah. hoping to see that damn sword somewhere on. Uh, they know that that sword exists because they've got photographs of the actual items. So it actually know. was made. Yeah, Jack. What's Jack funny is that it was. It was. A couple years it, ago. it was made from one of those famous uh, uh, replica prop. Making things, you know what I mean, like uh, 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 the the knife company. You know when you go in, remember? Franklin. Yes, it was. It was the Franklin Mint. It was the company that actually made all those items. And there was what? There was a crown. There was a sword. There was something called a philosopher's stone that was an a jewel encrusted piece of ivory, I think. Something like that. And then something else, a scepter or something like that. Right. And some but people the sword actually, is the thing that everybody wants. Some people actually have some of them. Right. Apparently, the two people won the items, and one of them, the guy needed to pay for college, so he actually had the item melted down. He kept the jewels, but he melted all the gold to pay for college. That sucks. But, yeah, Jack, Jack Tribule, I think, passed away a couple of years ago. But yeah, his, his kids. I'm sure. <laughs> I wonder where that thing went. But like, let's say he found it. Let's. Oh yeah, I have it. Can I have it? Like, no. <laughs> that thing's worth like fifty grand at least. You know, probably hundred grand by now. You know, he, he's gonna keep it if he has it. It's probably a vault somewhere. So. Right. So all these kids. Well, you know, Jack made a whole lot of money in his day. I mean, they they have a lot. There's a lot of money in that fortune. I mean, Commodore, Atari. He was he was a biggie in the industry. Yeah. <sighs> but I think most people just want to know if it exists. Yeah, you know? we're, we're, that's what I want to know. I just want to see it. I want to see right. a good photograph. Yeah, there apparently is not a good photograph that exists of the of the other two items. I mean, what's the big secret now? I mean, why? You know, I, I can understand back when everything was hitting the fan, being like cloak and dagger about the stupid sword, but who cares now? Just like, yeah, I own the sword. Here's some pictures of it. I get, or are they worried if someone's going to sue them or something? I mean, who cares? 
Well, there are a lot of weird people in this world and a lot of people who would risk life and limb for their Atari collections to the point of sneaking onto property of the Tramiel estate and start trying to break in because they're chowderheads. Yeah, I guess you don't want to go off advertising. you got really rare jeweled uh, uh, artifacts, huh? Correct. I mean, I'm sorry, but I mean, uh, a lot of people know that story of, uh, what's his name, Richard Garriott, where the nut job broke into his home, you know, and started telling him that he was, he started, after, after Garriott shot a three fifty seven Magnum in the guy's general direction, and the guy went to sleep in one of the bedrooms, and Garriott called the police, he told the nut job, told the cops that uh, he was on a, an Ultima quest. And actually was called by Garriott and told him to come break into his home. Um, Sounds like that, like that bad Tom Hanks movie, the Dungeons and whatever Dungeons. Uh, what was the name of that? Amazing Monsters. <laughs> it's like a real life version of Amazing Monsters. The guy who actually broke into his house, his name was David Dukes, I believe. He ended up uh, climbing over the wall in the middle of the night in Sea World. And he was found dead in Shamu the Killer Whale's tank. And at first they thought Shamu killed him. And then they found out he was basically not in his right frame of mind and drowned in the water. And Shamu was trying to push him up onto, you know, the edge of the, the, edge of the platform to save his life. And it didn't work out. Wow, that's a crazy story. <laughs> Did, he get, did the cops believe the story about the, the, the ultimate quest? No, of course not. They knew Garriott, and they basically, you know, well, going well, on. Story, but right. but the, story, the way he tells the story is great because apparently he's on the phone with the police looking at the man that's broken into his home and holding a weapon, a three fifty seven Magnum, to the guy's face from like 20 feet away. And he literally told me, he said, Okay, what are my rights? And he says, well, Mr. Garriott, this is Texas. If that man is in your home right now, you have the right to shoot him dead right now. Right. It'd be a, that'd be a dead mf -er, man, if it's, if it's me. <laughs> I wouldn't have even messed about it. 357 Magnum, you ain't messing around. You're pointing one of those at someone. Well, apparently he, he turned it and fired it somewhere near him, thinking it would scare the guy away. And the guy basically blinked and then walked into one of his bedrooms and went to bed. Didn't even phase him, so it didn't sound like. <sighs> Crazy. Well, it's uh, 344. You guys want to cut it here, and uh, we'll pick it up next time? I think so. We that sounds good. Yeah, well, uh, thanks for watching, and uh, we'll be back in a couple weeks. <laughs>